Hello there. Welcome to Virtual Vino. I'm Michael Woolley, and I'm Executive Director of Easter Sales of the Birmingham area. And I'm Caitlin George, Director of Corporate Development. We're sitting here with you at Trey Luna Restaurant here in Birmingham, and we are thrilled to offer and present a virtual wine class. Tonight we'll be going over pairings of wine and food that you might have at home. We'll also learn everything you need to know about wine. We're so excited to bring you this event. However, we'd so appreciate any kind of donation to Easter Seals of the Birmingham area. You can do this by logging on to virtualvino101.swell.gives or you can text ESBA2020 to 41411. With every $20 donation you give us, we'll mail you one of these beautiful wine tools. Thank you so much for joining us and cheers to a great event. Hey, we're going to be your host tonight here for our class at Trey Luna Bar and Kitchen. My name is Marcus Cobb. I'm a certified sommelier here. My name is Max Bonner. I'm on-premise sales representative with United Johnson Brothers of Alabama. My name is Emma Baldwin. I'm a bartender here at Trey Luna. And I'm Whitney Bird. I'm the bar manager here at Trey Luna. And we hope you enjoy our class tonight. Thank you for coming to see us soon at Trey Luna. And thank you for partnering with Easter Seals. Hey guys, so now we're going to jump straight into wine glassware. There's a number of wine glassware out there, I mean, an assortment of it. Um, you might pour it into a jar at the house, I don't know. Um, I drink it out of all different types of glassware. Uh, I'll just explain to you what we have to offer here at Trey Luna. Um, so if you were interested in a sparkling, whether it be champagne, uh, prosecco, uh, we start off with our fruit glass here. Uh, the way they each glass is designed is for you to achieve the best taste and profile out of each wine that you're going to have. Uh, so the, the flute is designed so that the bubbles are maintained in the glass so that when it comes out it's to its most intense flavor profile for you. Uh, it's very sweet and mild, um, but it's great for any spritz or any type of Prosecco drink that you would enjoy. All right. So next on you're going to move to your white wine glass. Located here. Uh, you can have Chardonnay, you can have Pinot Gris in it. Um, this mainly is if you were to bring the glass to your nose uh, when you're going to sniff, because there's four S's that you're going to go over. We'll talk about that after we go over glassware. Um, you're going to talk about, excuse me, you're not going to talk about, you're going to sniff uh, the wine straight there. It'll go into the nose, to the back of the throat. Uh, once you taste it, it'll go to the front of the tongue or the back of the tongue, depending on the shape of the glass or the intensity of the wine. All right, and next up, we'll move on to our Bordeaux stem here. This is where you get your big cabs. Uh, you can drink any Pinot out of it if you'd like to do so, uh, but the glass, the bulb of it is wide open to help air get into the wine, to help open up those tannins so that you get the full taste and profile of the wine when you get to enjoy it. Uh, and it goes from mild all the way to the most intensive cabs that you can enjoy in it. Uh, it's my favorite glass, probably yours as well at the house. You can pour almost a half a bottle into it and keep going. Uh, but I love this because I love caps. That's my preference. I, I want to interject here. There's two different styles of red wine glass, the Bordeaux style he just talked about, and then the Burgundy style he's about to talk about. And the different shapes are optimized for, in the Bordeaux style, a heavier red wine. And the Burgundy style is for a lighter red wine, typically a Pinot Noir. And the shape of the glass uh, has to do with the, the, the style of the, the wine that you're going to put in it. But a really easy way to tell, you know, if you ask yourself, should I be drinking this wine out of this glass or this glass, is if you look at the shape of the bottle and you look at the shape of the glass, usually a fatter glass is going to go with one of those fatter bottles, which would also be considered a burgundy style bottle, or a taller, thinner bottle, a Bordeaux style bottle would go with a Bordeaux style glass. Absolutely, that's a great point there. And so lastly, like you said, burgundy, it's good for burgundy blends. Uh, and that could be even a, a white burgundy if you wanted to cross over to that. Um, one of the best Pinots out there. I'm, I'm a Four Graces guy. I like, I like that Pinot as well. It's great if you are going to someone's dinner party, you don't know what to bring, always choose a Pinot. I mean, it goes, it's so fruit forward, light. You won't offend anybody if you walk in the door with a Pinot, I assure you that. So if you're pairing wines, more often than not, I don't know about you, but I love to pair it with some good cheeses. So here we have essentially our charcuterie, our antipasto. We have some fresh mozzarella, we have some gorgonzola, some aged smoked gouda, some prosciutto, 
copa, and Spanish chorizo on a bed of arugula with a variation of olives. I make this at home myself using maybe not these fine ingredients here, but with say pita chips, some crackers, and a variation of cheeses from my local grocery store. So this is a really easy one that you can do at home with some wines of your own, which Marcus is gonna talk about ours here. Yeah, so anytime you think of charcuteries, um, I would point to either Pinot, Pinot Gris or Pinot Grigio, uh, along with a Chianti, um, as far as two contrasting flavors uh, to go with the contrasting flavors that you're gonna have from cured meats, olives, some nice cheeses that can be sharp. Um, and some olives to help break the palate a little bit. Um, but I love a, a nice Chianti, and not, not just because of um, the famed movie uh, with Hannibal Lecter, uh, <laughs> but it, you know, fava beans would go great with our antipasto, but this Chianti is a great Chianti to definitely try. Um, but if you wanna go lighter in, go with a nice Pinot Grigio. Um, and a lot of people ask the questions on, what's the difference between a, a Pinot Gris and a Pinot Grigio? Um, which are, you taught me this yesterday. Yes. I had that question myself. Yes. So. so Gris are uh, the French style, or, and a lot of Americans have uh, adopted that as well. But the Grigio is, is the Italian style. Same grape, grown the same way, produced the same way. Just produced in different countries and, and styles. So. Uh, but these both pair very well with the antipasto to get your, your palate ready for the, the next course. So here we have our citrus herb shrimp. It's a ceviche style appetizer here at Trey Luna. It is a wonderful blend of both citrus and spice. We get our spice from the jalapeno and red peppers in it. Now ceviche style is made by marinating in citrus. So that's gonna round out the flavor and it's gonna make it perfect to pair with a few wines here that Marikas is gonna talk about. Yes, yeah, so we'll start and look over a few choices. This is where we can integrate some nice reds. Uh, I love Italian reds and also cabs here. So Italian reds would go with Rufino. Uh, it's a good uh, blend that introduces Sangiovese, the number one grape pretty much out of uh, Italy. Uh, and then you move on to your cab here um, to help get your, get, get your palate and, and also your esophagus ready for the heavier portions that you're gonna enjoy the rest of the night. Uh, but you pour your nice glass to get that open with. Uh, and then lastly, you also have our um, Lioco Chardonnay, which is uh, wheat berry flavors, um, a little bit of cream vanilla, uh, but it helps with the creaminess and, and uh, the creaminess breaks with the acidity in uh, ceviche style dishes. That's interesting. I never would have thought of pairing a red with fish, so it's good to know that you can Absolutely. do that. Yeah. You definitely can. I don't want you to be scared to do that. Yeah, awesome. Good to know. So we have our mixed lettuce salad that we have here at Trey Luna. It has fresh cut strawberries, candied pecans, goat cheese, and it comes with our balsamic vinaigrette. Uh, that we make in-house. The bed is a mixed spring lettuce that you can get at Publix if you want to recreate it at home. Buy some strawberries. Uh, they sell candied pecans they at Publix. I think you can get those there and goat cheese. You, you get the can little make, log of the chevron. Yeah, you can make your own little mixed lettuce tray luna salad at home if you wanted to. Um, and Max is here. He's going to tell us what wines we've paired and I'm going to so this is a little heavier, a little more full-bodied salad than the one we talked about earlier. So I decided I would pair two rosés and a red with it. Uh, the first one is going to be a sparkling brute rosé. Again, you're going to get those typical uh, rosé notes of uh, berries, which, you know, strawberries, which uh, obviously pair well with the strawberries in the salad. And the, uh, the dryness of the brute rosé is going to cut through some of that sharp acidity and fat from the uh, uh, balsamic vinaigrette and the uh, chevre cheese. And then the next one again is the uh, Tuscan Sangiovese Rosé. Again, that's guys, that strawberry characteristic, uh, gonna really cut through those fats. And it's not gonna overwhelm the uh, delicate flavors you're getting from that nice local hydroponic uh, spring mix. And then the last one is gonna be a Pinot Noir coming out of California, William Hill. That Pinot Noir is gonna be a lighter body uh, Pinot Noir. So if you are someone who just enjoys reds and not really a big fan of whites, that's something that you can definitely pair well. Again, nice light body fruit. Gonna be a little more like uh, blackberries, uh, but still not gonna be really heavy and will pair well with salads. Hi, now we're gonna talk about our fennel arugula salad that we sell here at Trey Luna. 
Um, it has an arugula base and it has shaved fennel, uh, orange prunes, toasted almonds, and um, some aged ricotta cheese on it with our citrus vinaigrette that we make in-house at Trey Luna. And then these are our four wines we've decided to pair with it and Max is going to tell you about those. So these four wines, all either white or rosé, nice light bodied wines, pair beautifully with salad. First wine here is going to be a Vermentino, which is an interesting native grape from Italy. Um, going to be kind of similar to like a Pinot Grigio or Sauvignon Blanc, nice bright citrus flavors. Then the second wine I want to talk about here is going to be Crowded House Sauvignon Blanc coming out of Marlborough, New Zealand. Very popular style now, the New Zealand Sauvignon Blancs. You're going to have that big grapefruit citrus. So on, on the Vermentino, you're going to get a little uh, more like lemon-lime type of citrus. As you move into the uh, New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, you're going to get that grapefruit citrus. Uh, the third wine here is Cipresetto uh, Rosé of uh, San, Gio San Giovese, coming from Tuscany. Very interesting wine, 100% uh, San Giovese in the blend, and you're going to get like strawberries, a little herbal note, and so, you know, different types of fruit, and then always a great classic pairing where the first course is any sort of sparkling wine. So this is Rufino Prosecco, light, crisp, easy to drink, wonderful on a summer afternoon, goes great with this summer salad. All right, so next up we have our margarita pizza. We have some of the best pizzas in town, just so for the record. Uh, Trey Luna, if you want to look for a pizza, choose us. Sorry, guys. Uh, but story on a good margarita pizza. Uh, it comes from Queen Margarita of Italy. Uh, she wanted a nice pizza that represented the flag of Italy. So that's why you got a red sauce um, that we're making house. You got fresh mozzarella, and you also have fresh basil. Uh, there's no better pizza that you can try. Uh, to go great with these wines that she's going to talk about for you. So just like Queen's Italian Pizza, we have a few awesome Italian wines here. We're going to start here with our Prosecco. So the thing about pizza is it could be an appetizer, an early course, or you could have it as your pleasure dinner. So we have a variation of wines depending upon how you choose to have your pizza. The Prosecco is a palate cleanser. so. It's going to go well with the cheeses, just kind of like the antipasto we talked about earlier. We've got that fresh mozzarella. Mm -hmm. Then also we have a dry white here, a little bit um, heavier than the Prosecco, but not all the way as heavy as our Borgiano, which actually means burgundy, mm -hmm. right Marcus? Mm -hmm. And um, that's gonna be our full bodied Italian red for if you wanted to have this say as a meal. It also is gonna get you ready for those heavier courses if you are having it as an appetizer. And actually, this is one of the very best wines, personally, as far as Italian reds go here at Trey Luna. And just remember that this is something that you can absolutely do at home, uh, especially with the pizza. You know, you can get pizza from anywhere. Of course, we do want you to order from here, but say you're not here, um, we're not capable of coming here, hence, the coronavirus that's happening right now. Um, this is a great version of something that you can do at home. So. Hi, now we're going to talk about our classic spaghetti and meatballs that we serve here at Trey Luna. We make our pasta in-house um, every day. It's so, so good. Um, and it comes with three meatballs um, and our marinara sauce that we also make in-house. And we are going to pair it with these four wines, and Max is going to tell you about those. So we have four wines here. Three of these are going to be Italian wines, and then one of them is a South American Malbec, which I thought would be fun to pair with meatballs. So the first one here is a Nebbiolo coming out of the Piedmont area. It's one of my favorite Italian grapes. You get, uh, it almost looks like a Pinot Noir in the glass and then has the tannin structure and the flavor profile of a much heavier big red wine. One of my favorite, just kind of fun, interesting wines. And this one is a DOC, so the levels of, uh, I guess the rules and the Italian uh, laws about wine. So this is kind of level two. And then the next one here is going to be a Chianti Classico coming out of Tuscany. It's going to be 100% Sangiovese, and it's going to be a DOCG. So it's going to follow a little more, a little more rules and laws to get that uh, higher certification. 
Then the next one's gonna be a Malbec. So on the Malbec, you're gonna get a little more interesting spice and fruit that's gonna pair beautifully with the acid, the tomato sauce, and the meatballs. And then the last one there is the Rafino Modus Super Tuscan, and it's an IGT. So the IGT basically means we didn't wanna follow any of the rules. And instead of it being 100% or 90 plus percent Sangiovese, to follow the laws of the uh, Tuscan uh, area, it is a blend of Sangiovese, Cabernet Sauvignon, and Merlot. So you're going to get that big Cabernet uh, tannin structure. It's a, a very nice red blend that pairs beautifully with uh, Italian food. So last but certainly not least, we have dessert. Everybody's favorite. We here have the white chocolate bread pudding. It is our signature dessert here and it is fantastic. It's baked here in house, of course. We've got it drizzled with a little bit of white chocolate sauce and powdered sugar. I just love this dessert. Do you love this dessert? I do. I can't get enough of it. It's so good. Um, the thing about desserts are those are everyone's favorite. However, dessert wines are a different story. And Marikas is going to talk to you about that. Absolutely. So dessert wines or wines to just finish a good evening. Um, I would start with a either Moscato or Cuvée. Uh, it is sweeter on, on the spectrum there, um, but it, it helps wash it down. It's, it, the sparkling version um, is almost like you started the day with the Prosecco. You're going to finish it with the sparkling as well. Uh, or you can move to a nice Merlot. Um, Merlot, if you've ever watched the movie Sideways from back in the day, back in my time, um, Merlot took a hit. Merlot's coming back is all, all I know. And so Merlot, I put it in the middle because Merlot has six letters, so it was middle. Uh, you can figure out if you wanted to do that one as far as in between the sparkling or between down to a, a red or a dessert port. Uh, and so lastly, we'll move to the port, a ruby port on the end there. Uh, most this, ports have... This is a wine that confuses me, for sure. Ports, <laughs> they're really confusing, so I don't really... If you could explain the so, difference between a full body red and a port, that would be So, cool. ports are more fortified wines. Um, they're a little, little bit more pungent, a little bit more intense. Um, have a lot of flavors on the spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. Hazelnut, uh, spicy fruit, uh, but it's medium uh, body in, in its existence all the way up to an intense one. Uh, but it, it is a very good way to end a day after enjoying our dessert. It's like a sweet, savory kind of thing? Oh, absolutely. Okay, I do like that. Absolutely. So. And you, smore them, you pour it in small portions. It's only about a three ounce pour that's standard. Um, I know we like to get generous at the house and pour what we like, but you only need about three good ounces of it to finish the day. So now we're gonna go over how to open a traditional uh, bottle of wine. So I have what's called a waiter's friend here, three parts, tool, lever, and a worm. So you're gonna take your knife and underneath the lip here, there's a small air pocket in what's the cap called the capsule here. So you're going to want to take your knife, you're going to want to get under there, and you're going to want to go around, and then come back. And if you're doing this uh, table side in a restaurant, you're going to want to make sure that you're trying to face the label to the guest the entire time. If you're doing it at home, I know that it can seem intimidating. I myself am not that great at opening bottles of wine. I have been known to uh, break the cork, which is embarrassing in front of people, but it's not the end of the world. Um, and obviously he's going to make this look a lot easier than it is at home, um, but it is pretty easy, so no worries. It's pretty easy. It takes a little bit of practice over time. Um, so your next step is you're going to pull the worm out here, and you're going to want to take and put the pointy edge kind of right near the center, and you're going to want to push straight down, and you're going to want to start to spin your corkscrew. And not push it into the line about three and a half spins. You want to leave a little bit of your worm sticking out and then this one has two steps. So the first step here you're going to want to pull down, pull up, and then you're going to go to your second step, pull up, it's going to come out. You don't want to remove the cork all the way with the corkscrew and you want to, and you also don't want to have a big pop. And then you're going to pour the wine And you do that small twist at the end to try not to have a big drip. Emma, taste with me. And then we'll say you're gonna taste this wine really quick. You're gonna to wanna to smell it, kind of see if you can find out some fruit, non-fruit aromas. And then you're gonna to wanna to taste it and enjoy it. Cheers. 
So here we have a sparkling wine. This is gonna be the same for your Prosecco, your Champagne, um, if you have a sparkling rosé, just anything with bubbles. That's a great way to put that. It's probably not the, that sounds great. the technical term, but I'm sorry in advance. So this also um, can be a little intimidating just because it can have a little um, pop behind it, so to speak. So um, even when I open this behind the bar, I'm always really nervous, but don't be. As long as you um, just take care, you should be you should be fine. I'm going to try not to put out your eye. I appreciate or that. Or anyone. Yeah, so don't do once, you, once you remove, so the, the metal piece on top of the cork is referred to as the case. Once you loosen that up, it's best to try and keep your hand on top of it the whole time. That way you don't put you or your friend's eyes out. Okay, so the cage is gone here, and we're going to hold tight to it. And I just use a little twisting motion. That's probably the best to do at home, keeping my hand on top. And it's easy as that. Would you like a glass? I would love some. Thank you. Cheers. Today we're going to cover a couple questions that have come in. Thank you for sending those in. The first one is Carrie from Mountain Brook. She asked, what temperature should your wines be, for red or for white? Also, Abby and Hoover asked, can you throw an ice cube in your white wine? So, temperature-wise with wine, uh, traditionally red wine is served at cellar temp or slightly there above. So, storing wine in, in the past, you used to always store it in your cellar. And that's going to be at about a consistent temperature of about 55 to 57 degrees. And so red wines should be enjoyed somewhere from 55 to 65 degrees just as the bottle warms up once you take it out of your cellar. Uh, and then white wines, a lot of people will take them out of the fridge for, you know, they've been in there for multiple days, they're down to 32 degrees. You pull it out and it just kind of is lacking flavor at that point. You want to serve that at above 40 to 40 to 50 degrees typically. That way some of the uh, slight more slight notes of the wine can kind of come out. Um, and then, so if you don't have a cellar and you want to bring your, your red wine from room temperature down to that 55 to 65 degree area, you can stick it in the refrigerator for about 30 minutes is a great way to do that at home. Absolutely. Uh, and just to piggyback on that, a lot of people uh, think reds are supposed to be drank at room temperature. Uh, so where that comes from is uh, old English castles. Uh, room temperature in an old English castle used to be 55 to 60 degrees brisk. And so we adopted that adage to think we're over here with uh, 73 degrees and 75, you know, and that's not ideal for wine consumption. But I mean, if you're on the patio, drink it, whatever you like. Um, but yes, ideally from 45 to 65 covers the full spectrum of wine temperatures. Uh, if you were setting a, a wine cooler on something to, to cool it to, I would say 55 would be ideal for both. And then as far as the ice goes, if you want to put some ice in your wine, if that's what makes you happy, do it. Especially, don't feel bad. If you want to put an ice cube into a gla glass of red wine that's a too high of a temperature for your palate, as long as you enjoy it, drink it. We have a couple more questions. One is from Jennifer in Peachtree City. How long are you supposed to air out a bottle of wine once it's been opened? Mm -hmm. You want to take this off? So it varies. Um, your lighter bodied reds and your whites and rosés, those and sparkling, open it start drinking it. Um, typically you're going to want to let a wine breathe if it's either you know, really old and some of the flavors have kind of concentrated and you want to let that give some time to kind of express itself or if it's a young wine that's going to be highly tannic because you want to let some of that settle out and that could take depending upon the wine anywhere from 15 20 minutes to you know wine can change and optimize it throughout you know three to four hours and there, there are some wines where I'll take them out one day and show them to customers and then put them in the, put them in my refrigerator with a cork in them overnight take them out the next day and they're tasting even better just as that as that air's gotten to them and kind of allowed some of those more subtle flavors to express themselves katie and homewood ask what is the difference between champagne and prosecco so champagne and prosecco are two different styles of sparkling wine Prosecco is going to come from northeastern Italy, and that, that's a region in the, uh, in the country there. And then the grape, and grapes as well are going to be different, as well as the style and the flavor. 
The, the Prosecco grape is a grape called Glera, and the style and flavor is going to be a lot more clean, crisp, easy drinking, not as complex, a great for an everyday sparkling wine. Champagne is going to be coming from uh, northeastern uh, France in the Champagne region. Uh, your grapes on that are going to be a blend or you can do single varietals of uh, Pinot Meunier, Pinot Noir, or, and Chardonnay. Uh, if you see a label uh, that says a Blanc de Noir, so it's going to be a white wine made from Pinot Noir. Blanc de Blancs is going to be all Chardonnay. And then also the way the secondary fermentation, which is what puts the bubbles into the wine, they uh, is different in the two different areas. In Prosecco, it takes place in tanks. So in the secondary fermentation process, you have a still wine that you then add more sugar, and that's called the dosage. And if you look at a label, some of them will say brute or extra dry or dry. And that goes to how much sugar is in the secondary, in the dosage, the secondary addition of sugar, as well as yeast is added. And so then fermentation takes place again, and that releases more of that carbon dioxide. In Prosecco, again, it's going to take place in tank, and in Champagne, it's going to be 100% in bottle. All right, fellas, y'all have given us so much information today. Tell us, what is a sommelier? So a sommelier is a master or, or someone who's mastered by study. Uh, the study of wine and its methods, its taste profiles, uh, the different types, the, the different grapes, everything that wine entails, uh, they've been tested over through written, uh, through oral testing, through blind testing, um, and you get certified through a, a board, kind of like uh, one that I know, Court of Masters is a good one, uh, but several different wine purveyors may also do their own way of certifying, uh, but those are the ones that are nationally recognized. Uh, but uh, sommelier is uh, a profession by some uh, and some high, uh, excuse me, high end restaurants that have one on staff uh, to answer any questions that a guest who's coming to enjoy a good bottle of vino uh, may have. Wonderful. Hey guys, I hope you've enjoyed this as much as we have. It's been a great night and we want to do another shout out to Trey Luna. They have been awesome. We're excited to mail you our wine tools for every $20 donation you give. And again, you can log on to virtualvino101.swell.gives or text ESBA2020 to 41411. It's been so much fun. Cheers.